Here in space, heaven and earth touch. Here in this place, the gateway to grace is wide open. Here, the people of God come to worship, and God enfolds us close in a welcoming embrace. I am with you, God declares. We repeat God's welcome in this community of grace. I am with you. Let us worship. Help us to listen to the groans in our midst, O oh God. Creation's groans of labor pains, our neighbor's groans of loneliness, the groans that we bring with trepidation and awe. We come bringing the yearnings that are on our hearts this day. Draw us into your waiting presence that where we can learn how to wait as you wait, eagerly, hopefully, joyfully for our holiness to grow and our chafe to be burned away in the brilliant fire of the spirit. Amen. Amen. Invite you now as we worship in song, gather us in. God, we often confuse your time for our time, your world for our world. We lose sight of what is truly important and think we have all the answers. When we feel strong and confident, we forget you and your dreams for us, this church and the world. Help us to see that we are wound up in a tangled web of community with you always at the center. Amen. Please join me in the assurance of pardon. Our God is patient and understanding. We are waiting and groaning, but God is at work already revealing hope that we cannot quite see. Still, this hope saves us. Our God redeems us and revives our spirits again. This is the mystery and the glory. Hallelujah. I'm gonna invite you now to join me in prayer. So God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning and we thank you for your presence here. Thank you for gathering us in. God, we ask that you would be present in this time, that you would empower the, the words of scripture, and the words from my mouth by your spirit to speak to our hearts, to our minds. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So our first scripture passage this morning comes from Genesis, it's the 28th chapter. It's going to start with verse 10. And this is the um, this is the story of Jacob's ladder, when Jacob fell asleep and had a dream and dreamed of this, this ladder. But I also want you to pay attention to his reaction to the thought that he was actually in the presence of God. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a stairway set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Our second reading this morning is from Psalm 139, 1 through 12, and then verses 23 and 24. Hear the reading of the words that you've just heard sung to you. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and night wraps itself around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is a wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'll tell you what, it has been, the last couple of weeks have been very, very challenging on, a, on so many different levels. And um, we've just had a lot going on. If you um, were in the sanctuary, you would see that there are two giant um, floral displays up front that were um, left behind from the funeral for Emma Schaefer that we had last Friday in our sanctuary and in our commons, hundreds and hundreds of people um, were in our church to pay their, their respects to Emma for her life and, and the work that she, that she did. Um, so there was that, there's been a heaviness over things. Um, and as as we've walked through these last two weeks, the um, I've been chewing on this psalm, this Psalm one thirty nine. And I told Susan the other day, I said, you know, for some folks, this psalm could just be like a slap in the face, especially those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, who feel like you know this this God of the Psalms that claims to be with us wherever we are. You know, sometimes we're just not feeling God's presence. And then I thought, you know, this, this passage is, you can, you can read it with different emotions, and it comes out differently. If I read this, and, and it, when it really comes down to um, what God is to you, how you relate to God. There are so many folks whose first emotional reaction to God is fear. We we talk about lethal theologies, you know, theologies that that tend to uh, to tear us down rather than build us up. That's one of them in my book. Is the theology to that that God is a, this gigantic being that we should fear. An all-knowing, all-seeing, always judging, waiting for you to mess up, waiting for you to do something wrong so that they can squash you, punish you, or send you to, send you to hell to burn forever. Fear. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, I can't get away from you. You're always there. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee? Where can I hide? 
You see that how that fearful image of God brings destruction to us. Because we're always waiting for something bad to happen to us or waiting to be punished. And that's not the relationship that God wants to have with us. That was, I mentioned when we read the Genesis passage, you know, to, to be aware of Jacob's reaction once he found out that, that he was in the presence of the Lord. And it was to be afraid. He was afraid to be in the presence of God because in his culture, gods were capricious. They were, they did what they wanted. They used human beings as playthings. They weren't just. And he was afraid. And friends, we have a God who doesn't want us to live in fear. There's another emotion that I've tied, tied in with this that, um, especially in the last couple of weeks, when things that are happening just don't seem right, they don't seem fair, you can have an angry relationship with God. God, you have let me down. You know, I could, like I said, this could be like a slap in the face. You're supposed to be here. You're supposed to hem me in. You're supposed to protect me. Where are you? Why aren't you doing your job? You're supposed to be there for me, and you're not. I know a lot of folks who carry a lot of anger towards God. I know I carried a lot of anger towards God when I was growing up. He took my dad away from me when I was a teenager. And I did not forgive him for that for a long time. I was angry. But I was also brought up with that fear of God kind of theology there. So I was I was scared because I was angry with God, because I thought if 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 God knows I'm angry, then then I'm going to get punished. You discern my thoughts from far away. How scary is that? Because I know what I'm thinking and I don't want God to know what I'm thinking. But we. We think we can hide those things from, from this all-knowing God. It can be frightening. It can also provoke anger. But the psalmist, David, had an interesting relationship with God a very personal relationship with God, and one that was based on love and commitment that was on display from both sides, from David and from God. And David did some pretty bad things. I mean, a little adultery, murder, um, things that we feel like um, our just God would have squashed him for. But what overrides all of that is the love that God has for us. And that justice comes from that love. That when God loves us, God's not looking to squash us, but God is looking to restore us, to bring us to repentance and forgiveness and restoration. And sometimes we forget that restoration piece. Imagine reading this, this psalm from, from a place of love. Imagine that, that there is a God who loves you even though God knows what you're thinking. The good, the bad, the ugly of, what we, of where our minds go. And yet God continues to love us and to support us. God doesn't hem us in to, to control us or to bind us up, God hems us in to protect us, to be with us, so that we know that God is always, always with us. 
It says, if I take the wings of the morning and settle in the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If we read this from a loving relationship with God, that is good news. Because no matter where I am, no matter how deep and dark the place is, or no matter how high and light the place is, God's hand shall lead us. God's right hand shall hold me fast. And there's times in life where there's just nothing better than to know that God's got a hold of me. And that God will, will carry me if necessary to get me from, from one place to another. We come to a place where we can trust in a God who loves us. Trust that God will be there. There's, um, Jeff and I have a, a favorite singer. Her name's Lauren Daigle. She's writes incredible songs. And um, she reminds me a lot of what I heard about uh, Emma this past week, all the things that 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 made her made Emma special or things that that I think are special in Lauren Daigle but she wrote a song called I Will Trust and it really struck me as I it came on the radio yesterday listen to what she says see if you can identify with this when you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through when you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. And the song goes on to say, you are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. My prayer is that we could all have that, that level of trust and belief in a loving God that is steady, strong, comforting. Even when things don't happen the way we want them, even when we're asking God to move a mountain for us and, and it doesn't move. when we ask the questions that we don't get the answers to. That we have a deep enough relationship with God, a love relationship, not based in fear, not tainted with, with anger on our part or expecting anger on God's part, but a relationship built, built on love. There's one last piece of this, because when I, when I get angry with God and I ask God, why are you letting these things happen? Why aren't you interceding? Why aren't you reaching down? Why, where's that strong hand? I'm not feeling it. I'm not seeing it. What about these these horrible disasters that are occurring? What about the crime that occurs, the violence, the those who die too young? Why am I not feeling that comfort and that strength? And as I spent time with that, with the Lord, I, I felt like, I felt like God rolled in front of me a giant mirror. And said, you are my hands and my feet. If folks are not feeling my love, if folks think that I'm unfair, if folks think that I'm uncaring and unfeeling, look at yourself and ask yourself, am, are you being a conduit of that love? and that light from God? 
because folks, we having a relationship with God is essential. Sharing that love and that light of God is also essential. People are introduced to God through us, through our actions, through what we do, and, and their impressions of God come from what we don't do. It falls on us as God's church, as God's people, to bring that love and that light, to draw folks in to the God of Psalm 139 that loves us unconditionally. That's our job. That's on us. And it's not us just going out and talking about it and telling people you need to believe in this and believe in that. It comes through how we relate to one another. Are we the hand to hold people fast when our friends are struggling? Can we provide that guidance and that love? Can we be the ears of God to just listen without judgment and to love and support one another as we share our struggles together? It's a lot of work to do, a lot of things to be done, and that can be overwhelming too. I don't want to go... There's times I just, I don't want to go be God. I can't be God. I, 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 I don't think I'm a good witness. I don't think I can do these things. Well, folks, we're in, we're in the season of Pentecost. And um, this morning, I'm going to wear my red stole with the Holy Spirit on it. Because if you're feeling doubtful about your ability to be the hands and feet of God, remember that at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and descended on the disciples that were gathered in that upper room. But it wasn't a one-time event. And what happened was most important than, more important than focusing on the flames on their heads. What's important to focus on is the Holy Spirit came and empowered those people to do the work of God. And they did miracles. They built a church. They came together. They were unified because of the work of the Holy Spirit in them. And that same Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit that comes today. It's the same Holy Spirit that empowers us, that gives us wisdom to know what to say, that gives us the strength to just stand beside someone, to gives us the courage to help folks face their enemies. It fills us with trust and hope and joy. That's a whole nother sermon talking about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the whole the whole gamut that comes to us, and that is available to us today. And that's what empowers us to do the work that God calls on us to do, to love one another. So I pray for you in two ways. I pray that, that the fear would go. I pray that the anger, if you have an angry relationship with God, that, that the, the love of God, which will not stop, no matter how angry you get, no matter what you want to say to God, and I encourage you to do that. Tell it. Tell God what you're thinking and feeling. God can handle it and allow God then to love you. And I'm confident that eventually it's that love that will overwhelm the fear and the anger, and you will come to a place of trust. Or even though we don't see God doing the things that we think God should be doing, we still trust because we are loved. Because we are loved. Amen.
We are called. We are called to be that light and that love. And as we enter into our offering time, I want you to consider how, what are the gifts that God has given you that can be used to reflect God's love and God's light to those around you? Enjoy those gifts. Use them with humility. And change this world through love and justice. There are other ways that you can give the, through the bank deposit, all the, the, the monetary gifts that you give to the glory of God. But give of yourself as well. If you join me in the prayer of thanksgiving, with all that we have and all that we are, we reach out to you, our God of generosity. We ask that you receive these ordinary gifts. May they be used to offer extraordinary blessings in our community and world. May these gifts remind us that through you, all is possible. And now, oh God, we come together and we pray the, the prayer that you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now as you go from this place, may God's love hold you. May God's light guide you. And may God's liberation free you. Go out into the world with blessing in your life and the blessing for the lives of others. May every rock and stone be a place of wonder and hope. Amen. Amen.